Next on our program is Bob Olander. He's on the staff of the Head Foundation. He's a former drug addict. And next we'll hear from Bob Olander. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to express my personal thanks uh, as a representative of the Head Foundation to the people who invited us here. This is uh, the way the foundation supports itself. HEAD stands for Health Education About Drugs. I almost fell off. It's a, uh, <laughs> God. It's a uh, nonprofit foundation, which was founded kind of as a grassroots movement thing by myself, an ex-addict, uh, a lawyer, a businessman, and the past director of the Pilot City Methadon Program in Minneapolis. For one reason, really, they saw a need, or we did, for honest drug education. And I know that word is overused, but really, most of the drug education in the past, a lot of it even today, is so crammed with mythology and opinionated kind of things that it just isn't making it in terms of young people. And that's kind of why I'm here tonight. I, I'm not going to get into chastisement of educators, of adults, of young people, of dope fiends, and that whole bag. I'm going to get into more the relationship that you people are going to carry on with young people as teachers. And the kind of things that went on with me in the years that I was in the dope, in terms of teachers, the kind of things I'm getting from kids now, I've talked to about oh, I don't know, about 120,000 kids in the last 10 months. When I say kids, I mean young people from ages four, fourth grade through college in terms of just rapping a little bit about what's happening. And much of what I like to say tonight is going to be feedback. But also, I'd like to make our hour a little less formal in terms of you've had two hours of lecture and that's enough for me. I mean, uh, I think... We're going to throw it open more to a uh, dialogue kind of thing with some question and, you know, not the formal question and answer, more of a discussion kind of thing. And again, I, I'm not making reference to the fact that the two lectures weren't important. I kind of like both the fellows that were here tonight talking to you, and I think their kind of thing is more of a, you know, blackboard and putting some information out and some ideas, this and that. My thing is just maybe a little bit of more... Uh, talking a little bit about some of the things I've seen that might be of help to some of you people. In terms of the rest of the foundation, I want to get this commercial out of the way, like the un in un uninterrupted movie. Uh, we, our underlying purpose, by the way, the reason, one of the other reasons we're into education is we hope to open the first Synanon-like treatment center in, the, in Minneapolis. All of you, as residents of the Twin Cities, should really kind of everyone, I guess, should be ashamed of themselves that we got a town or a community of a million and a half people. And we don't have a therapeutic live-in center, whether it's a Archway House, a Synanon, Odyssey House, something like that. We don't have it. Nothing. You got a few phone services. You got a couple, uh, you got some hospitals with clinics that cost enormous amounts of money for a kid to get into them. Uh, you have nothing that is a live-in kind of thing for the severely dependent person on chemicals that can't just go to an outpatient place and make it, that needs some definite live-in care along with some uh, aftercare outpatient thing. And we have been allotted or granted a certain amount of money from the federal government under the Omnibus Crime Control Bill, providing that we come up with 40% of it. So that's another reason we're out, you know, trying to raise money and to do things. That's where the money that we get from speaking programs and this and that goes doesn't go in anybody's pocket. I, it'd be incredible if I really considered I was worth uh, any more than about uh, $100 an hour. But, uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, no, the money, the money that we get, you know, I feel is a pretty good thing. I, there are a lot of organizations, foundations around that people are questioning nowadays. But I feel we just don't have our hand out. We're, we're asking people for something, we're willing to give something in return, and we're offering something to the general public that I think is worth looking at. Uh, one comment about when I say synonym-like treatment. A lot of people have made synonym to be the treatment facility, and it is good. 
I mean, you're talking about 65 to 75 percent arrest or cure rate compared to many of the governmental things that are boasting maybe 3 to 8 percent. However, one thing you have to remember, a lot of those people who fall in that 70 percent have not left Synanon. They do not go back into society. They live their lives at Synanon. Their kids go to school there. Synanon is building a city in Tamales Bay near San Francisco. Synanon has withdrawn from society. Now, a lot of people say, so what? So what if these people don't go back into the society? In fact, the, the motto at Synanon is, society is corrupt, the jungle that isn't worth living in, we're building a new world. They, have their, their, they live there, their education is there, their kids are brought up there, they really don't leave there. Now, that's why I feel sometimes Synanon is, you know, some people get a little overrated on it in terms of that, because maybe if, you know, you can't really withdraw from society completely. Maybe the goal should be get those people back out trying to change the things that are happening out in this jungle, whatever. However, I would like to say that Synanon is, is really good. I mean, the, the good effects far outweigh the, the little hassles they have in terms of what they're doing and what the people might be doing. And if any of you get a chance to go out to the West Coast, stop in and visit them. They, there's no question about the fact that Dietrich started something that has been the one way for many, many dope fiends that have never made it and would never have made it without it. But I would like you to, to realize that I say this in reference to our center because our treatment is going to be long range, six months to two years, but it's going to be geared also to getting people back out on the street, that kind of thing. I don't want to spend much time on talking about myself, where I was at, this and that, but briefly I got into drugs, uh, about 11 years ago, grew up out in St. Louis Park, white suburban community, and you know, it's funny, uh, the drug problem wasn't really a problem, you know, until the white suburban communities, middle class people started feeling the, the brunt of the problem. You know, when the, the ghetto had the problem, that was just the ghetto problem, so naturally it's going to be there, so you can't do much about it. Uh, educators didn't push their students to take so many credit hours of drug education, although it's been one of the state board of education rules since 1925 or something like that. So one of those laws that just wasn't enforced, evidently, and now it's going to be enforced. But whatever our criticisms might be, at least we're doing something now, and that's important. You know, that thing better late than never, I guess. However, one thing you might realize is that people and great numbers of people were taking dope 10, 11 years ago and they didn't just live in the ghetto. They lived in Hopkins, St. Louis Park, Washburn, Ramsey High School, Minneapolis area, Roosevelt. If you took the two methadone programs in Minneapolis, took the lists of the people on them and pinpointed the communities that they grew up in, the greatest amount of kids proportionately would come from Park and Hopkins seems as if St. Louis Park and Hopkins has a corner on the dope fiends in terms of the methadone programs. All I'm saying that is so you have an idea that this thing just isn't some, you know, brand new kind of thing. The kind of drugs maybe people are getting into have changed, but not much. I got into uh, booze. That was the first chemical I got into, and I think we should start talking about chemicals because every time you say drugs, people think of three things, marijuana, heroin, and LSD. When actually, statistically, numbers-wise, you've probably been told this already, but the four drugs that are abused by more people are tranquilizers, amphetamines, barbiturates, and alcohol. We got some 22 million people hung up on those four drugs. That's an eighth of the population. That's really incredible, considering how much of that population is into uh, our little kids or our old people, you know, who aren't really chemically dependent in terms of, you know, old people are on pills a lot, but they got to stay alive sometimes. So, uh, so chemicals are doing some good things. The point is, when you ask some questions of why drugs are here and why kids in the street are taking them, remember this fact. The majority of young people who get into drugs start on alcohol, inhalants, and pills they get out of the medicine cabinet. And that doesn't just come from my head. It comes from most of the surveys being done. In fact, even the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, who a lot of people won't even believe, you know, whenever they say anything, 
even they have come out and said that over 90% of the severely chemical dependent people who get into chemicals while they're teenagers start on pills that come out of medicine cabinets. And it just isn't their house, you know, it's grandma's house or uncle or aunt's. You talk to a lot of kids and when they go to parties, the first thing they do is check the medicine cabinet or the master bedroom, the shelf there. That's the first thing they do. You'd be surprised if we went out and just up and down walking the streets, the amount of painkillers, uh, tranquilizers, diet pills. I mean, diet pills might well face the fact, you know, they're speed, that's all they are. Amphetamines, methamphetamine, hydrochloride, dexedrine. That's what speed is. That's what most kids get into. They aren't into this. There's very few people really doing a lot of crystal meth. Most of it that they're into is they'll shoot up uh, dexedrine, dexamol, uh, dysonics, you know, things like that, that they get here, they get there. So the first question might be that someone would ask, when you think about where drugs are at, if availability is one of your prime causes, is why does the medical profession seem to think it's supporting the paper industry the way they write out prescriptions? You can have, you, you have a right to ask that question. You have a right to ask the Pharmaceutical Association why they're going to produce one billion amphetamines that mathematically can't be prescribed this year. I mean, where are one billion amphetamines going to go? You might ask the major pharmaceutical companies why they make millions of dollars every year by selling pills to Mexico when they know that the major source of the illicit pill market comes from Mexico. You go down to Mexico and you walk into a drugstore, walk along the shelves, and it's like taking a tour of the United States. Uh, Eli Lilly Company, Indiana, uh, Park Davis, Minneapolis, Squibb, Upjohn, A.H. Robbins. You see in Mexico you can buy tranquilizers, diet pills, barbiturates, codeine, and Demerol over the counter. No prescription, just like aspirin. And I mean, these people now are telling us that when you call and ask them, say, what about this? You know, do uh, you really need all that money and all this kind of thing? You really got to sell them all those pills? You don't have a big enough market here? They'll tell you, well, don't, don't chew us out. You tell the Mexican government to pass laws. It's not our fault. I mean, we're just, we got it. We're in the business to make money. What I'm saying here is, as kind of a preface, let's start examining some people who have been almost like sacred cows in terms of constructive criticism in our society. Let's start asking, if we're going to point fingers at the young people, at the permissive parent, at whatever, you know, let's also point it at some other people in terms of the drug problem. Because, you know, people take dope, people, human beings that are part of a community. And there are certain professions, for instance, the medical profession, the highest single paid profession in the world. Isn't there some community responsibility aside from, you know, office calls and prescriptions and healing and operations? If one doctor would stand up, especially in small communities, if any of you go there, you get the local doctor to stand up and people listen because, you know, he's the guy who knows everything. A lot of people feel that way. And again, I'm not, again now, I'm not picking out doctors and, you know, personally crucifying them and saying they're the cause of it, this and that. I'm just asking people to, if we're going to criticize certain elements, let's criticize everyone constructively. Sure, there aren't a lot of doctors that might be, you know, really wild on scripts, but there are plenty. The years I got into dope, I went right from booze to cough syrup to barbiturates to morphine. Stayed on morphine. Then in the mid-60s, I got into psychedelic drugs when very few people were doing acid in this state in particular. In fact, the LSD, some of it even came right from Sandoz Company in Switzerland. The, the vials, LSD 25, 90 micrograms, and the little tabs of 120 micrograms that were pure LSD. That's when the real sugar cubes were around and the uh, pouring LSD, you dumped a little vials in some orange juice or something. Anyway, all that time I got into dope, opiates especially, codeine, pills, morphine, I got every bit of my drugs from a pharmacist and a doctor. There are plenty of those people around who will bend the law to make money. Pharmacist made the bread and I got the habit. It was as simple as that. Again, what I'm trying to say, 
the myth that the kid in 10th grade who's dealing a little grass to his friends or can make a connection for pills or acid as the pusher who should be put away for life has to be exploded. That person is no more the pusher than the kid who buys it. Every person I know who does dope, every person I know who does dope sells dope when they can. Every person I know who sells dope usually does dope. When we're talking about the street scene, the street level. If we want to do something about availability, flow of drugs, we have to take two steps back and look at three agencies, three things. Again, the source of the pills, the flow of the drugs, and the money that protects both of those. And I mean that literally. Big money in powerful places. The legal system and the congressional system has a lot to do with in terms of how drugs move and how they get in here. If people honestly believe that there isn't big money in dope and big money breeds corruption and greed, if they, if they don't believe that, they're, they're, they're in trouble. What I'm trying to say again, and I want to get more specific now, is I want to just paint a few overviews of what you might think about when you start thinking about drugs. And then you might look at yourself and really ask yourself, you know, where do you stand, really, in terms of what's happening? Are you concerned, in other words, paying lip service, or do you care and are willing to get involved? Because the majority of you probably, I, I, well, I may be wrong, might not be health and phi ed teachers. The health and fire teachers are the ones who are going to have the drug thing when they go into their schools slapped onto their back. A lot of you are probably, you know, might just be regular teachers, this and that, so you are going to have to, you know, decide, well, how am I going to get involved? Because you might not be part of the major curriculum. And you go, I go around to a lot of schools and I find out that many of the teachers could care less. They teach English, you know, and they'll talk to their students and that's it. And another thing is very, very few of them seem to talk with the students while they're talking at the students. And you talk about a little formula in terms of drug education. It's built on this. It's built honesty breeds credibility. Credibility breeds trust. And trust breeds communication. People will talk to you if you aren't a threat. People will talk to you if they trust you. And when people talk to you, you can reach out. And when people reach out, they solve problems. It's really, really so incredibly simple sometimes that all our experts with their abstract theories have just blown their heads off with all this garbage that floats down from Nirvana or Olympus in terms of uh, you know this kind of thing and that kind of thing. When it boils down to people who are there touching people, teachers, parents who see the kids, who are with the kids, who talk to the kids, who can be a source of trust and communication. And if you don't think that's where it's at, you look at the drug programs that are working, and they're all founded on that kind of thing. When I got into drugs, there are a few things that went on in terms of school that, and also some people I got involved with that are worth talking about. And what I talk to young people about is dependency is what breeds continued drug experimentation. What I'm getting at is, you know how people say, well, if you smoke pot, you will go on to heroin. Well, okay, we're, we're not even going to talk about that. Let's talk about what really happens. I'm drinking cough syrup on the weekends. And then I'm drinking on Sunday afternoons because Sunday afternoons are a drag and cough syrup feels good. Then I'm drinking on Wednesdays to break up the time from Monday to Friday until I can get high on Friday night. So that time won't be so long. So now tolerance is developing, which develops with most of your drugs except the psychedelic drugs, which is pretty convenient for those people. They don't need to smoke a lot of dope. They don't need to drop a lot of dope to get the same feeling five years later. So that argument, kiss it off if you're going to talk about psychedelic drugs. Because you see, the minute you start slipping in points that aren't consistent, the kids shut, click the switch off. The minute you'll say something like, the tolerance to marijuana is phenomenal, 
anything else you might say that's good just went out the window. You have to have that consistency to have the honest credibility. Okay, drinking the cough syrup, taking it more often, this and that. Now dependency is developing. And dependency means that you can't seem to go to a party unless you get high. Dependency is when you need a couple drinks to dance at a party. Or, you know, dependency is when you have to have a couple shots of booze to rap a little better when you're at a social affair. You know how people say, I don't really feel like relating to people unless I get a little oiled. You know, my inhibitions go down, this and that. All right, that's dependency. Now, I'm not going to talk, I'm not talking about there's degrees of it now, and there's what we as society have termed legitimate and illegitimate dependencies. So we're talking about a whole attitudinal thing that we could spend two days on. Anyway, what I'm talking about is how people really get into dope now, drugs, in terms of really dependent. And this can be pretty well related to alcohol, I suppose, too. I mean, they're, they're part of the chemical scene. All right, you're becoming more dependent on the drug for fun, so now you start cutting loose of the things that are real. Friendships, people, all things you might be into that you did care about once, whether it's school, speech, drama, sports, any, now this, I'm talking about the teenager. And by the way, I'm concerned with the kid 12 to 17. He's the person I'm concerned with. I'm not talking at anybody else when I'm talking about relating to young people. So you're getting into this bag more and more and more, the things that give you status, prestige, and reinforcement switch from reality to the chemical. That's dependency, and that's what leads to continued involvement. Because everyone needs status, prestige, self-respect. And if dope is it, you need to take more dope to, to keep your respect or to keep your status or to get more status. In Synanon and other places, they call that dope fiend behavior. I'm a bigger dope addict than you are. Listen, the biggest problem we have with addicts coming into our Pilot City program in the groups is that they want to check everyone's tracks to see how bad they are. You know, the, the needle marks on their arms. You see, that's, people don't realize the tracks, mainly these big black marks you see on some people, are not caused from them taking any more dope. It's caused from the impurities in heroin that don't dissolve in the tissue. If you do dope, drugstore dope, morphine, dilated, and be fairly careful with a needle, you aren't going to have any marks in your arms at all, and you can sh shoot dope for 15 years. So that, that tracks thing is the mark of an addict. But see, that is a mark. That's your status. The amount of dope you do, the kind of dope you do, that's what breeds going on to other drugs. Plus, if it's opiates or uppers or downers, you get more of a feeling when you change drugs. That's the things we have to relate to young people about. Status, prestige, self-respect, identity. And you do that by talking about things that they're concerned with. You take dope and you're going to get busted. Well, the kids are thinking, oh, that's not going to happen to me. Or if it does, I'm going to get probation. So you talk about what probation means. That's something that happens right now if they get busted. They can feel that. Talk about how you don't go on vacation without written permission if you're on probation for a felony. You don't get married without permission when you're on probation. You talk then about what a felony means, especially to high school kids. A lot of them have no idea what a felony is. They don't know how that could really hassle your life around. If you'd like to be a teacher, a social worker, or going to law, medicine, this and that, you get a felony for a drug conviction, and you see how willing people are to license you. Sure, you can get it done. You can make appeals, get pardons, but time is involved, freedom. You talk to young people about the things they can feel, freedom, independence, and individuality. They aren't such far away hypothetical concepts. They're right now. Kids can feel them. When you talk about drugs and the effect they have on those things, you can make a point only though if you are non-judgmental. The hardest thing for anyone to do is, inject their, is not to inject their opinion. A lot of people will rap with young people about drugs with the heavy overtone that they are bad and if a person takes drugs, he is bad. In other words, they put down the person instead of the problem. Or let, they let their opinion influence their thing. 
you talk to kids about freedom and you talk about individuality and independence and you ask them to ask themselves some questions. How artificial is it when you need to take a chemical to enjoy a rock concert? When you take drugs or a chemical to enjoy something, do you lower yourself a little bit to say, I need a chemical to, to enjoy myself? In other words, you have to ask them to ask questions which cannot be answered very simply. You see, we've taught young people real well how to manipulate. I learned that really well. Treatment programs, probation officers, teachers, they'd ask me, how do you feel about school? I like it. What do you want to be? I want to go to college. That's that right there. Signs, signs your little adjustment sheet, and they tap you on the back and say, you're okay, take off, you know. Uh, how do you feel about drugs? They're bad, I would never touch them. In other words, people ask kids just the kind of questions that'll fit into just the right slots, and they check it off as being okay, and they don't bother with it anymore. The kids know this. They've been taught real well how to manipulate. The people, the most successful people, are people who have openly said they cheated on their income tax, they stepped on people to become successful, you know, our great leaders, this and that, are people who might have really crushed some people on the way up, and yet they're viewed as these successful people. So, therefore, young people have had some pretty good, you know, uh, teaching in terms of manipulation. And you see, it's very easy to let people manipulate you because then you don't need to get involved. In fact, you don't even admit there's a problem because you, you got a piece of paper that said the kid doesn't take drugs. He, you're the counselor and uh, he's told you that. And naturally the kid's going to tell everything to a school counselor so you don't have a problem. You know, th this is the kind of thing that people, this kind of things that I'm talking, these kind of things are the things that people divorce from drugs. They act like drugs are, you know, something that comes in a cloud and sneaks up on a community and zaps down a few lightning bolts or some pusher sneaks in from the lower side of town and hangs around the high schools and, you know, this and that. And, and no, you know, it's there, it starts there, it lives there, it breeds there, it, it's happening there. It's people. Those are things you just can't chuck out the window. There's a fellow who a lot of people kind of go for. His name is Dr. Albert Schweitzer. And uh, he's got a definition for education. It's three parts. First part is example. Second part is example. And the third part is example. You see, no matter what you tell young people or teach them, their measuring stick is what's happening around them. Their friends, their environment. Not some book, not Mod Squad or Dan August on TV, not what's happening in California, but right now, right there. You tell them you take LSD and you're going to go to the funny farm and one of their friends takes LSD, comes to school on Monday and gets an A on the math test, you're in trouble. You've got to realize what they're going to do with the information they, you give them as teachers. You've got to realize how they're going to take it out of context and apply it to their scene, their group, their friends. When you do that, you can begin to start approaching it. When you talk about the psychedelic scene, the biggest thing that I would not do, took me eight and a half years to do it, was to admit that the dope scene was phony. When you're taking dope, you're not about to admit that you don't know what's going on. You're not about to admit that most of the mescaline you're doing is acid, that THC is non-existent on the street. You're not about to admit that a lot of the dope you're doing is garbage because you're taking it and you're a big man because of it, in your own eyes or not, or you're having fun because of it, for any reason, you're doing it, so therefore, you're not going to knock it. You're not going to admit it might be phony. You can ask people, if you're screaming about society, the establishment being very phony and artificial and materialistic, how phony and artificial is the street scene? You ask people those kind of questions, and they don't like it especially if they're into it. They're going to say, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, you're, they're, you can say something like, most of the Mexican you're doing is LSD. They're going to say, oh, man, I get it right from California. The guy knows one of the biggest dealers in town. My pills have a little balloon that pops out of it that says this is mescaline, you know, that kind of thing. 
I mean, you can just point out things like mescaline, for instance, you need 500 milligrams of mescaline, synthetic mescaline, to get off on. That's seven and a half grains. That requires a pill about an inch long. That's a big pill. These little chocolate pills and these little orange flat pills that were going around on the street as mescaline are all about 50 micrograms of LSD and about 30 milligrams, milligrams of methadrine hydrochloride. THC is non-existent on the street. It's almost impossible to synthesize cheaply. It's very expensive. And these caps on the street, these white and gray little pills for a buck fifty, two bucks going around as THC, are really between five and ten milligrams of fencyclidine. It's an animal anesthetic, a dog tranquilizer. And this isn't just hearsay information, this and that. One of the associate directors with our foundation is Dr. Scott Davis. Some of you might know him. He works with Yes in the farmhouse. He's a psychopharmacologist from the U who writes a little column uh, in the underground paper, 100 Flowers, once in a while, called Stone Notes. And he has a little lab over at Deal Hall where he analyzes street dope for heads or addicts or whoever, you know, no names, no questions, this and that. And uh, he's never seen any THC, rarely, rarely seen much mescaline. The organic mescaline is sometimes even more frequent, the actual peyote buttons, but you'll know if you have those because you'll probably puke immediately when you take them. I mean, uh, the way they hit your stomach, the acid in them is just something else. You're just you're going to get sick a little bit. But that's what I mean about when you talk about those things, at first you might be faced with kids saying, oh, come on, you're square, this and that. But then when they start hearing it from a few other people, they start to maybe look at that. And the best thing a teacher can do is use resource people. The biggest thing adults have trouble doing, seemingly, is saying, I can't do it alone. I'll take some help. I'll get into somebody. The other biggest problem adults have is they get their degree, they become parents, adults, and they quit learning. Bam, they stop. They don't read, they don't relate. They don't, I mean, it's just all over. You know, it's the paper and the 6 o'clock news, and that's it. When a person stops learning, they stop growing. When they stop growing, that's kind of sad. I don't think everyone, anyone should ever reach the point where they feel complacent enough that they don't need to grow anymore. Well, I've taken enough time. Let's kind of throw it open. I've missed some things that I wanted to say, but I can't remember what they were. So we got some time to just have some dialogue. So why don't we do that? Does anyone know what time it is? 9.30? All right, well, I was told I could, keep, you know, I could keep you here as long as I wanted to. I mean, can you see this thing at 1030? Well, by that time, let's say half have probably, you know, excused themselves. But the other half, you know, they don't want to embarrass me. They're being polite. They're going crazy, you know. They want to get out of here. So let's have a, you know, throw it open for a little bit if you'd like to. If anyone would like to make some comments or ask any questions. And I'll try and think a couple of the things I was going to say. We don't treat anyone. There is no one there at head. No, the treatment center is not, an, uh, not a reality yet. That's what we're working on. That's what the grant was for, and we have to raise $15,000 in order to get the grant. You've got to raise 40% of what the grant is to get it, and that's what we're doing now. We hope we've got some buildings that have been... People have kind of made a verbal commitment that we can use that building if we get the money. We've got one building, has got a kitchen facilities, room to house 60 people, and we can get it for a token of $10 a month rent. So that's what we're shooting for. But we've got to have the rest of the money to get the grant. Or you have to show, like, well, pledges, you know, uh, to show that you will have the money. You don't have to show 15 grand, but you have to show, you know, the ability to ha have it or something like that. So we're getting it. So right now, we're just a few of us, well, myself, uh, Scott Davis, Dave Cooper, are just kind of in the education end, and we do some offshoot counseling once in a while. If someone uh, has a group of people that wants to have us come in every once in a while and talk to some kids, we'll do that if we have time, but, you know. I, thanks for clearing that up. I didn't make that very plain. Yes. The farmhouse, that's on the West Bank. That's primarily like... Uh, a walk-in counseling thing. 
It's open from like 1 until 1 in the morning, and on weekends it's 24 hours. It's primarily geared to the soft, well, the psychedelic drug user, and they also have been given a grant, and they're opening shortly, I believe, a treatment center live-in for 10, they're only gonna, they only have room for 10 people, but it's gonna be more short range. They figure two, three months maybe. Then the person will go into outpatient. They have groups at certain times. It's a terrific kind of place. So just drop into it any time. They don't have, you know, you can just walk in and talk to people, see who's ever there, this and that. They're doing some counterculture kind of things with rehabilitation, that kind of idea. That's another thing, you know, people never get into. They always say, We've got to eliminate this drug problem. But you see, you're fighting one big fact. Dope feels good. People like pleasure. I don't care how much you say they don't go after pleasure. They dig it. They like it. They want it. So what you have to do is you have to show people other kinds of groovy stuff other than, you know, get high on life. I mean, that's, that's great, and you know, I, a lot of people do, you know, but you don't tell a kid who's been shooting speed and smack and feeling great to get high on going for a walk in the woods, you know. You just can't. So you talk about things like, uh, oh, uh, psychedelic space art, you know, the natural use of sound, colors, and throwing it up on a wall and sitting there and getting into it. You talk about Zen, mysticism, uh, Kids just macrobiotics, kids just dive into that kind of thing. This Dr. Judy on the West Bank was getting all kinds of acid heads into macrobiotics, and the kids were turning on to natural foods. They just loved it. It was great. I mean, you know, you're not going to get those, a lot of those people back into sports or the speech club or, you know, the YMCA activities. You're going to have to talk about doing things that are different. You might start a little group that meets, uh, you do this thing uh, with your sensory modalities. You get a few people, you lay down on the floor and, and you cover your hands with gloves and put on earphones and blindfold yourself so you cut out feeling, sound, and sight. In about two minutes, you're tripping like mad. Just like tripping, uh, it's much like some hallucinations you might have while you're tripping, only you can get up and stop at any time you want because your mind is, you blot out all those other things and your head just zoom, takes off. It's really a kid's look. Get into that kind of thing. That's just as phony as drugs? Well, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, why is that phony? I mean, I I've, haven't heard, I mean, is Zen phony? You know, a way of life, a philosophy? Is Christianity phony? Is uh, you know, sitting down and enjoying colors and sound and music and absorbing it, you know, with your mind that's been given to you by something, someone, phony? I, well, why is it phony? Well, inside of themselves, meaning. Explain yourself, you know, would you? I'm not quite sure what you mean. I'm not putting it down, believe me. Oh, well, sure, that's, you know, part of that. But the whole point is, everyone gets out of themselves once in a while. You just can't make it, man, if you don't. You know, release, you've got to have it now and then. If it's going for a walk, if it's going out to a movie, if it's taking in a concert, if it's just sitting and daydreaming, that's getting outside of yourself. I'm talking about offering people, aside from group therapy that they'll learn, that they'll learn to know themselves, other kinds of things that will get their heads doing different fun things where they can see that chemicals aren't necessary. You see, what you're talking about is the answer, yes. But see, that process you don't just get to like that. You don't just say to someone, learn yourself, get inside yourself. When a guy's been severely strung out on chemicals, it won't work. Now, some people have had terrific luck using religion. I know a couple of friends of mine that have changed their whole lives. They went through the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, the whole thing. They really did. They really believed it. And I believe them. I believe this really happened. Now, I don't necessarily want to get into, do I believe that something supreme power caused it to happen? I, I'm not going to get into that because I think faith, if you believe something, you can do wild things with yourself. I don't care how it happened. All I know is they're making it. You see, what I'm trying to say is I'm tired of the one way. You don't deal with people one way. Treatment centers too long 
have been fitted to a pattern rather than to the individual. Multiphasic kind of ideas is what is going to make things go round. Because human beings are not the same. I don't care what biology, what religion says. They are essentially different people with different heads and things going on. And you have to treat things differently. But you're right. That's what the final treatment, what, what the final hopefully answer would be is to know yourself. To be able to yourself rely on who you are to make yourself you. I'm just talking about ways to give people some things that will give them some pleasure without dropping chemicals. Because they've got to have it. Again, now, again, now, I'm talking personal opinion, too. Yes. Well, that depends. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. She wondered if, can you talk about freedom and independence to a guy who's using dope? Will he buy that then, or does he have to be off dope before he'll think about that? Well, I don't know. Uh, I've been using it with some young people I've been working with, and I don't know how it's going to work out, but I do know that people haven't tried it. They've tried all kinds of other things, but they haven't asked, really asked the addict to take a look at where he's at. Or they haven't approached young people before they get into drugs with those kind of questions. So if you're saying to me, will that work? My God, I'm not sure if it'll work, and it won't work for everyone. I'm trying to say that I think we got to approach this thing a little differently, and I'm trying to throw out some different suggestions that I've seen around, you know. And I wish I could tell you, you know, if it will really matter then or does he have to wait till later. To some people it has, to some kids it hasn't. I know the basic thing I always got from people was this in the past. How can you be so ungrateful to take drugs? You know, no, really. How can you be this kind of person? What are you giving society? Uh, what, are you, uh, what are you doing with your life? You know, what's your, what are you going to do about college? What are you going to do about getting married, having a family and a nice house? See, I was always told that I didn't fit a certain mold. And therefore, that's why drugs were bad. If I would have been able to fit that mold and take dope, half of those people wouldn't have really cared. But since I didn't fit the mold, the dope was the problem. The mold's okay, but the dope's a problem. Yes, ma'am. What made we want to quit dope? Methadone. That's really ironic, isn't it? A chemical got me into the thing, and the chemical turned my life around. I went to the methadone program with the same attitude I'd had for six years in terms of treatment. Well, I'm going to go here, and I kind of I want to quit, but mainly I don't want to go to prison. And uh, I need to get on some treatment programs. I got some cases pending and, you know, this and that. So I'll try this one. And boom, I went there on a Thursday. I was strung out, took some methadone. I went home, and for the first time in six years, I didn't feel like I had to go out and get some dope. And I, and I couldn't believe it. I just sat and, th and just sat and actually said, well, maybe I can really go back to school again. And uh, two months later, I started at the university. That was a year and a half ago. I started back again. I'd been going off and on. I got three pages of transcripts. <laughs> uh, and I'm not even a senior. It's a lot of transcripts. Withdrawals. <laughs> I must have had to work to buy the drugs? No, no, no. I, you mean I must have had to commit crimes? Is that what you mean? You can't work and support an opiate habit. You know, I stole, you know. I, or else I burglarized drugstores, uh, robbed, and, fa and forged prescriptions. I primarily forged prescriptions. That's why I was able to keep a habit really down, see. I mean, you can buy out of a drugstore 26 or 4 milligram Dilaudid pills for a buck 50, and they sell for 100 bucks on the street. So I could get by on 20 bucks a week and have a real heavy habit. But the minute those prescription blanks ran out and I had to go on the street a couple days, I was spending 200 bucks a day. And that usually I got by uh, shoplifting. Addicts are not into violent crime. That stereotype is so mistaken. I mean, they're into sneak thieves, shoplifting, forgery, uh, burglary, things that don't involve violence. Very, very rarely will a person on opiates or almost any drugs who's really strung out 
get into violence except for the alcoholic and the speed freak now and then. But most of your other drug addicts are very passive. All I want to do is get high and be left alone. And that's it. Would I explain what methadone treatment is? Methadone is a synthetic drug which is used to treat only hardcore opiate addiction. It's both long-term and short-term. Some people feel that some people would go on methadone for a couple of years, then gradually detoxify, get off of it, stay with group therapy. Others feel that some individuals will be on methadone all their life, much like an insulin, uh, a, per a diabetic is on insulin, you know. It uh, uh, does some real funny things in terms of being unique. Because methadone uh, the brand or street name or uh, brand name is dolphine hydrochloride. The Germans developed it during World War II because they didn't have any morphine. They needed a synthetic. And here's what's different about it. If you keep the dose at a certain milligram level, it curbs the psychological need without producing euphoria. So you break the cycle of taking a drug, euphoria. Now, the other key is that it's taken liquid and not injected, so you get away from the needle thing. You break that kind of thing. But the whole thing with methadone is supervision. You just don't hand it out to anyone. You don't give it to anyone. You control the dose. You get the person taking it right there at the clinic to begin with. You're very careful about it. Methadone, you can sell it on the street. You could get high off methadone if you took enough of it. That's why you are careful with methadone. And some people, yes, are going to have to use it all their life. So what? <laughs> you know, they're making it. Across the country, over 70% of the methadone people are making it. And living in society, living in the jungle, working, going to school, this and that. In Minnesota, the Pilot City program costs about 2000 bucks a year per person for methadone, group therapy, the facilities, the medical care, this and that. And in this state, and that person is working, helping pay taxes, he pays on his bill what he can, and that two grand might sound like a lot, two grand per person from Hennepin County. Well, you know that the state of Minnesota spends seven grand per man per year for every person in St. Cloud and Stillwater, and 60% of them go back, and 90% of those up there for drug-related offenses are back on dope within six weeks. Seven grand a year per man. And they aren't paying taxes. They aren't out in society working the whole thing. Yes. I mean, the guy, she said there's an addict on NARA. That's the Narcotic Addict Rehabilitation Act. That's the guy down at Lexington or some, you know, uh, the 5% that have made it in the past, 95% that haven't. He says that methadone's a cop-out and that uh, you should be able to make it on your own. Well, that's typical of the attitude that people have had. The only way to quit using drugs is willpower. You know, so that, well, if he feels that way, and if he can make it, terrific. I think it's great. Any way you can cut it, that's, what, that's what's happening. One way is not the way. Nara, that's a terrific idea. Aftercare is the whole key. The only thing about Nara is you're committed to it for three and a half years, and at any time you screw up, they can jerk you right back, or they can send you to prison. But... Uh, that, now, that's a personal opinion. Those kind of things to a lot of guys are, are good. They like that control. And they do have an aftercare agent, you know. I think they need more of them, though. That's the only problem. Some of these agents have 25 guys, one guy, and these guys can fool, get around them, you know. And the other thing is when they get out afterwards, they don't have any group therapy sessions. Most of them don't. Excuse me. Got time for two more if someone wants to throw them out? Anybody like to throw a couple more out? Or anyone like to make any comments on anything that's been said here? Yes, sir. So more information? Uh, well, you mean like, uh, well, I'll tell you what you could do. You could go down to the farmhouse and spend a couple hours someday. If you got two hours and wrap with some people there. You could go over to the Christian Brothers thing in St. Paul. That's, that, that's starting an inpatient live-in treatment center for boys, 13 to 18 years old. They've got 14 kids there. And they got some pretty okay people there. You might uh, stop down to yes, you know, yeah, uh-huh. Well, I don't mean talking to them. I mean talking to some of the people that are running it, you know. And then if you feel, you can talk to them, you know. In other words, let those people feel you out. That, that, I appreciate that comment. That takes a lot of honesty. A lot of people don't, aren't honest enough to say. They just might not be able to make it uh, with young people. And you might, you know, feel the people out there and see if, well, 
you know, some of the things you might be thinking about, the guy might say, hey, that's what we talk to these kids about all the time. You know, and that will take away that problem. The other thing you might do is you might, uh, oh, call up uh, the two methadone programs and see if you could possibly come to one of their group meetings. And you don't ever need to be afraid of what you'd say there, of offending anyone. I mean, most narcotic addicts are beyond being offended by anybody, you know. So you don't need to worry about that kind of thing. And, uh, oh, I'd say uh, you could also write the National Institute of Mental Health in terms of literature. I think they've got the best literature around. Yeah, I, I think they're the best, personally. And they're Washington, D.C. I think you can even write and ask. Now there's, uh, what you might do, uh, there is a booth or something over here, like across the hall where the coffee was. Look at some of their material and see what it looks like to you. See, you know. I haven't yet to look at it, and I don't know, you know. I, I think you could look around to a few places. You might uh, call anyone you think might be doing this kind of thing. There's a place, Minneapolis Health Department. Why yes? Is, I'll tell you what's so great about yes. 24 hours a day, you can call them and get a list of every single agency person in the whole drug scene in, in the Twin Cities, just to fit the kind of need you're looking for. You know, tell them what you want. They give you a list of the places, the names, the whole scene. Thanks for the question. That's a pretty good question. Yes, sir. Well, do I think we're going to whip uh, in terms of you know doing something about severe drug abuse? Now, do you mean the young people, the teenager? Is that the person you're concerned with? Okay. And do you mean the whole chemical scene of alcohol, uh, heroin, acid, speed? Do you mean that also? Okay, uh, I feel that until we change attitudes, and attitudes change environment, we're in trouble. So we have an environment right now which is based on instant gratification. You plug in the TV set, you plug in the TV dinner, you turn the car key, Bam, 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 bam. Now, right now, the attitude that a composer excedrin can solve the problems that you have. I mean, what did people do 50 years ago without excedrin or compose? Until we can change the attitude that we've gotten so sophisticated, our society, technology, and that's the big problem. Until we can catch up with technology, we're in trouble. We're about 20 years behind our technology. And when people can't cope with technology, they become frustrated, anx anxious, so pleasure is the escape mechanism or the escape valve. Okay, until we can get people out of their little capsules of the woman's club, the golf club, the little league, the peewee league, the boy scouts, the girl scouts, mother goes here, mother goes there, she, dad goes here, dad goes there, this and that. Uh, people live eight feet from each other out in the suburban housing tracks and they don't even talk to each other. Houses eight feet apart. They, don't, they might know the neighbor on their left and their right and that's it. You know, nothing else in terms of their community. Until people get rid of the capsules and just step across and talk to each other, no, I don't think we're going to whip it. And education to me is very important because, you see, education doesn't solve anything, but education can provide the means for communication. Because when people are ignorant, and that's not stupidity, ignorance is human. When people are ignorant, they have more problems. I don't know about that. I don't view it today, but might be something to go on. But no, until we can maybe turn some of those things around, we have problems. If you mean, if you know, if you ask me, could we whip it by more laws, by more treatment centers, this and that, I don't think you meant that. And I want to just point out that I am not up here tonight making any comments that do not say, you know, laws aren't necessary, that we need drug enforcement, this and that. I'm saying that isn't the key. That, that isn't going to stop drug abuse. Capital punishment has provided no deterrent to murder. I mean, let's be honest with what is happening. Well, does anyone have a closing 
red? Yeah. All right. Let's say you've never used any drugs, uh, and or you, you and you want to relate to someone who never has. Well, first of all, I think you talk about the kind of things they care about most, and that's their peer group, friendship, and status and freedom. All right. You you relate those flowy things up here to them, to their individual scene. And you talk about how chemicals can change that, how chemicals can prevent certain things from happening. But you do it in such a way that makes them make the decision. In other words, you making it for them, they won't buy. Then maybe you talk to them a little bit about the most precious thing they have, and that's their mind. And you talk about how chemicals do funny things with the most precious thing they have. Then you might even talk about the body to some of them. Some, what I'm saying is, you see, some kids might reach to something. In all the kids I've talked to, I've never had any of them come up, any two of them come up and say they liked what I said for the same reason. Or it hit home for the same reason. So the one kid might dig when you talk about how it screws up his body. The one person might think about when you say, what if, now this is an if with capital letters, what if LSD or some of the drugs cause some kind of damage to unborn children? How do you as an as a 18-year-old girl graduating from high school who wants to get married, how do you live with the fact your kid is born without any arms and legs because you turned on a dope, if that's true? That's really wild when you think about living, trying to live with that. Now, they haven't proved beyond a shadow of a doubt in terms of that it will happen, but there have been some people who think it, it can. You talk about different kinds of things in the drug scene that would affect a young person and vary the approach. There is not one way to walk down the middle of the aisle here, so to speak, and say, now, this will prevent you from taking drugs and your freedom will be lost, so all of them will say, oh, I don't want to lose freedom or your independence. So you combine the kind of things that chemicals do always by prefacing it with the other side of the coin, by admitting dope feels good. Feels mighty good to float through the air, jump off the Fauché Tower and sail on the air currents, but you, you eventually hit the pavement. You can say drugs feel good and not endorse drugs. That's just one side of a coin, two-sided coin. That's kind of the approach I personally suggest. Now, a lot of it depends on how you relate and how young people accept what you say and the position you're at in, the, in their frame of reference by their measuring stick. Well, thanks. Thank you, Bob. Tonight was kind of an introductory session. Tomorrow night and Wednesday night we'll have teaching aids, materials, and different things. So we'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you.